Director and Chief Economist at Crystal. Good to have you both on the show. Methali, I'm going to come to you first and let's talk a little bit more about the currency. Do you think that the central bank is going to limit now the gains of the rupee from here on, despite that the fact that we may get a favorable election outcome? Uh, well, it's uh, very early to say because one really doesn't know what the election outcome is going to be. So my sense is that we're going to see the rupee showing a little bit of sideways movement, roughly between 60 and 61, 61, 50. And anything beyond that, maybe the RBI would not be very happy and then might intervene. But for the moment, I think we're going to see only sideways movement, which will continue at least until the election results. That's my sense because we also have the FOMC meet on Tuesday and Wednesday. So FOMC is expected to continue to announce a tapering. So unless something dramatically changes over there, I don't think we'll see too much movement, neither too many unpleasant surprises or pleasant surprises, whichever way you look at it. The thought, Methali, I just need to address some numbers. Godrej, consumer numbers are out, 236 crores versus uh, 205 crores on an adjusted basis. Otherwise, it was 336 crores. But at 236 versus expectations of 220, the reported pad is marginally above estimates, 5 or 6 percent above what we were working with. Watch out for the sales numbers, 1924 versus our estimates of 2011. So there is a growth, but it's slightly lower than what we were working with. Now, I don't know whether this means that volumes have been slightly lower because the expectations were that the volume growth would be around 6% in Q4 versus around 4% in Q3. So we'll wait for the volume numbers to come in. Top line is marginally below estimates. Bottom line is marginally above estimates. But I think you would look at the volume growth and maybe that would be slightly lower and maybe that's why the net sales have been lower than what we were working with. It's almost 100 uh, 100 odd crores lower than what we were working with. So top line definitely below estimates and maybe that is something that is disappointing the street. Mind you, it typically used to be a slightly lower volume stock but then volumes have picked up considerably in the last uh, whatever three odd months and consumption as a space is out of favor currently. But GCPL out with numbers, HUL will come out later on in the day. And I think volume growth will be the thing to watch out for. We, were ex we are expecting 6%. Let's see what the show in Q4 volume growth. Uh, um, the top line is definitely uh, around, around 200 crores below what we were working with. Okay, that's how the earnings have currently shaped up and clearly the stock isn't uh, taking uh, too much cognizance. It's down by just about 1.3% as we speak, 12% growth in the top line. But let's keep it then uh, with the macros. And Mr. Joshi, wanted to come to you as well with your views on where you see the rupee now headed and if on expectations of a favorable election outcome, what's the best case scenario in terms of rupee appreciation versus the USD? Well, I think uh, we'll, uh, that will come to know after uh, May 16th as to where the rupee goes. Uh, it will it'll critically depend on what happens uh, in elections. But I think before that, I agree with uh, with uh, with Matley that it will uh, it will hover around the current levels. Uh, I think sometimes going up, sometimes going down. But I think 60, 61 is is the level that we expect it to uh, continue until elections. After that, I think it'll the movement will be shaped largely by what happens in elections. And as far as the FOMC is concerned. I think we don't expect any surprises, and uh, our expectation for the for the year as a whole is that they'll wind up the the the, the tapering by by December uh, uh, 2014. So that's that's our expectation on the external uh, environment as far as the tapering is concerned. Uh, so rupee, I think, more or less uh, uh, around these levels, and our overall expectation for 2014 is that by March 2000. Uh, 2014-15 is that by March 2015 it should touch around 62 a mild depreciation because we expect the current account deficit also to go up next year uh, from from the from what is expected this year marginally though. Uh, Dr. Joshi, you spoke about the FOMC completing its you know, announcement to be on more or less on course and that the entire tapering exercise would be over by December. But actually, if you look at that 10, 10 billion every month, as it were, then logically it should end much earlier by October. So where do you think the FOMC will pause and extend it till December? Well, I think that that's very hard for me to predict, but I think our overall call is that by December you should see the end of I mean the tapering uh, taken care of. It's very difficult to predict at this juncture as to when uh, when they could uh, pause a little bit. I think this is an upper limit. I think that we are giving December. It could happen before December also. 
And were you at Crystal a little surprised by the fact that there's been so little reaction really to the fairly sharp tapering? Because after all, we're seeing it now considerably less than what it was, 85 billion at the beginning of the year. So are you a little surprised by the fact that globally markets have not really reacted as sharply as one would have anticipated? Well, I think as far as India is concerned, the, the, it's, it's pretty easy to understand why the rupee has been more or less stable. The reason is that your external vulnerability measured from the current account deficit perspective has reduced. Your CAD has come down very sharply and so your external financing requirements are also lower. So in this, and, and I think at the same time, RBA has also tried to get uh, FC and RB, uh, NRI deposits. So I think if you put all that together, your, uh, your external vulnerability is, is low and the shock is as expected. So I think that's why the rupee is behaving. Uh, behaving uh, uh, in a stable manner. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, we just heard Mr. Lemaya of IDFC talk about, you know, what is necessary that we need to revive investment sentiment. What, to your mind, is the, are the most critical things that any new government should do in order to revive investment sentiment? Well, I think first of all, we need to get a stable government uh, because that is uh, that is the first uh, that will give a first booster to the sentiment. And then I think what really matters after that is what kind of policies are followed. And I think we have pretty sticky issues. Uh, the uh, uh, from a foreign investor perspective, I think the issue of retrospective taxation should be squarely addressed. But if you look at the domestic front where there are too many problems, I think land acquisition, environmental clearance, uh, you need much more clearer policy and uh, directions as far as these are concerned and uh, I think that that to me would be a greater uh, 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 will give greater comfort to the domestic private corporate investment investments are still happening but I think that what has what has withdrawn who uh, is, is the private corporate sector private corporate sector investments have fallen quite sharply uh, they were about 17 percent of GDP in 2007 and currently they are about 11 percent of GDP and reviving that I think uh, as I, I mentioned two things but I think uh, if you if you if you work swiftly on these, I think that should that should help in uh, in, in bringing the private investor back. But let me also point out that the, a sharp increase in private uh, investment should not be expected because the capacity utilization in the economy is very low, and there is uh, there is spare capacity in many segments. I think once uh, uh, once uh, uh, once the the capacity utilization rises, only then there'll be uh, there'll be further kick to to private investment. Right now, I think it's the it's the environment environmental issues, the, uh, the land acquisition, and also fuel linkages, particularly for infrastructure sector, which, which I think are critical to address if you, if you want to improve the efficiency of existing investment. And that is a prerequisite for further investments to take place. So I think it's a, uh, it's, it's a policy uh, 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 stance that the government takes and, and how they are going to uh, uh, do these things. I think more clarity on that will, will, will encourage the private investor. Uh, Dr. Joshi, you spoke of spare capacity in many sectors of the economy, but the fact is that despite that, prices have not really corrected. So what explains this apparent contradiction between the existence of spare capacity in the economy and prices not coming down? Well, I think prices in the manufacturing sector, they might be sticky in some parts, but I think overall, if you look at uh, consumer goods, etc., the prices have uh, have been rather price increases have been soft and I think what you also uh, don't capture in the indices is that there are there are these uh, discounts etc that are offered I mean in FMCG products buy one get one free that doesn't get captured in the price so I think we the measurement of the price also f doesn't fully reflect that right now the uh, the uh, the manufactured uh, inflation is I think is, is quite quite reasonable I would say it's only in the C new CPI index that some of the services are seen to uh, seen to show high inflation but the manufactured products are, are despite the cost increases, in, uh, wage increases, etc., that took place, uh, I think still I would say that the, the scenario is more benign in the manufacturing sector where, where the capacity utilization is, is quite low. Leave it at that. Thanks so much for taking the time out and being with us and giving us your views and your opinion. Metli, uh, just one final comment from you. I was reading uh, the Times of India today. And while it is known, they made a very relevant point that an El Nino year need not mean that it will be a, a drought impacted year. It's a, it's a necessary condition, but not a sufficient one. So therefore, while we talk about an El Nino coming, it may well be that the impact may not be as bad as what a lot of people are thinking about right now.
Oh, absolutely. It need not be so bad. But the fact is that we, we I mean, we could have, this is something that we could have done without. Because this year, if you see, the GDP growth has been shored up by fairly satisfactory growth in agriculture. So at a time when manufacturing is not going anywhere, services growth is declining, the last thing you want to see is agriculture growth also being affected, at least to some extent. So that, I think, is what makes everybody more upset because here was a case where you thought agriculture would perhaps come to the rescue of the economy. And that's not going to happen. And it's not just agriculture GDP. The rural economy is a huge driver of demand for services, for manufactured goods. So clearly, this is something that we could have done without. It might not be the worst case scenario, but even so, it's certainly not the best case scenario either. And at this juncture, I think we were hoping for something better than that. Bethley, thanks so much for joining in and giving us all of your views, views on the show. On that note, we slip into a quick break. It's a very range-bound market. We talk equities when we return. Stay tuned to Market Center.